So I, I heard uh, that there was some discussion this morning about the fact that we weren't talking enough about sales. Well, it turns out that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm really going to talk about uh, what's important for you guys to be thinking about as we go forward. Uh, my, my talk was officially titled The Future of Digital Distribution and Ebook Marketing, uh, but I've also uh, thought I could have titled it Why There Will Always Be Publishers. Uh, I also could have titled it What Publishers Need to Do to Survive, because all three of these things, I think, are, are closely tied up together. First thing we might think about is that our you know, challenge in the face of all this new technology is to build the coolest uh, new enhanced ebooks. I actually think that's not the biggest challenge we face. Um, you know, there's certainly some cool things uh, happening. I look at uh, uh, some of the discussion. We see transmedia tales and the future of storytelling. I did a blog post myself about augmented reality novels, uh, so on. We've seen uh, the idea of augmented reality and repair manuals being talked about. Uh, fabulous uh, uh, product dem demoed by Hillel Cooperman here yesterday, A Story Before Bed. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. You know, this is a lot of innovation. It's really cool. Uh, Mitch Wade Group has done this fabulous iPhone app that's totally reinvented the field guide. You know, um, it's called iBird Pro. Um, fabulous new category. But this is your cautionary tale. Rand McNally, more roads, better directions. Was that really the future of, uh, of eBooks, the better atlas? I think, uh, I think not. You know, here's a publisher that ran into a, a technology buzzsaw uh, and uh, it made the sort of the ebook version of what you might imagine the future to be uh, somewhat irrelevant. And so if you think that you're going to be the winners in a technology race, you know, that involves coming up with the coolest new applications, uh, you know, where you've turned books into something new and different and special, you're betting that you're going to be smarter, faster, more creative than all those uh, developers and entrepreneurs out there. And I just want to remind you that even in our traditional publishing world, you know, in the old days of, of print and bricks and mortar, most of the creative new uh, types of books were developed by authors. Now, again, there are innovations that come from publishers. And I, I like to think, for example, that we've been innovative. We've introduced many, many new formats and types of books that have been extraordinarily successful and widely emulated in our little section of the field. But that's not the heart of what we do. I had this great conversation last night with John Ingram, and he said, the ugly stuff will always need to be done. He actually uh, used slightly more colorful language. You can kind of guess what he really said. Uh, but. Uh, this is, is really the heart of our business. You know, your job as a publisher is to do things for authors that they can't do for themselves. You know, things that require special expertise, things that require scale, things that are expensive, things that require marketplace leverage, right? Things that are boring and time consuming. You know, because there's a lot of creativity out there. There are a lot of people who are going to be inventing the future. And again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be trying to be creative and and uh, do innovative new things. But don't hang your hat there. Remember w what you really do. And a lot of what you do is not the cool stuff. It's the boring stuff. Things like production, distribution, pricing, channel management, marketing, and sales. And you've got to be good at those things in this new era. You've got to be good at them. Because if you're not, someone else who is is going to take your place. Because that's fundamentally what, what distinguishes a publisher. You know, why is this? And there's a wonderful quote I found recently from Samuel Johnson. No place affords a more striking conviction of the vanity of human hopes than a public library. And I said this some 250 years later, uh, much less elegantly, when I said obscurity is a bigger problem for authors than piracy. Right? It's really hard to get found. Right? And we've seen this again and again. So when I see something uh, like uh, browse more than one million books, what do I think about? Man, this is a tough problem. It's not going to be easy to be found. 
in this new world. And we've watched this happen again and again from the early days of the web. We introduced the very first uh, web portal and we hand listed all the websites. There were only 200 of them. Right? Before long there was Yahoo and then it was a search engine scale problem and Google last year announced there were, there were more than a trillion web pages. Big haystack. Right? But it happened again. You know, we had, we had blogs and it was this great leveling and everybody could be a publisher. You know, and that, you guys probably remember well enough back in the late 90s when blogs first came on. This is actually from the Internet Archive, uh, the early blogger sign-up page in 1999, this promise of self-publishing. Well, guess what? Uh, a few years later, Clay Shirky wrote uh, this wonderful essay called Power Laws, Weblogs, and Inequality. Why was it that this medium already seemed to have uh, this architecture in which some animals were more equal than others, to quote uh, George Orwell? Uh, and, you know, we, we saw that happen. If you look today at the top blogs, you know, 10 years into the blogging phenomenon, 10, 12 years, all of the top blogs are publishers. Right? They're actually companies that are in this business of uh, creating a platform that, through which authors share their voices. And so when you look at, at the, the, some of the bloggers who, who are on the Huffington Post, sure, there's Ariana Huffington herself. But my gosh, John Cusack, Bill Maher, these are people who have stature. Why are they on the Huffington Post? Why don't they have their own blog? Right? And it's, it's because publishing with the Huffington Post gives them more visibility than they can get on their own. Ariana has worked tirelessly to build an audience, to build a channel. Now, what about Twitter? Once again, it's fresh new ground, new medium. Well, guess what? Before long, power law again. And, uh, you know, this is the top 1,000 Twitter users. You can kind of see that uh, it, it falls off pretty sharply. Now, what about ebooks? You know, this is from last year, uh, back in March, when we were waiting for the billionth download from the iTunes App Store. Early, you know, arrivals, great results. It's getting harder and harder to get found. There are now something like 28,000 ebook apps on the iPhone. This is a, starting to be a haystack problem once again. All right? So, part of what we have to think about is how do we get through the haystack? And the reason why this keeps happening again and again in each new medium is, is it's all in the math. And I really got this uh, driven home to me once uh, by a passage in Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. He was talking about why complex societies seem to evolve. And he traces all back to sort of food production and so on. But he eventually gets up to this evolution of complex societies. And he, he just did, this, did the equation. He said, look, relationships between a small band of 20 people involve only 190 possible two-person interactions. This is pretty manageable, right? Uh, yeah, but if, if you get up to a band of 2,000 people, you actually have almost 2 million possible one-on-one -on -one interactions. Okay, now start imagining, okay, well, we have a million books uh, in print, and we have hundreds of millions of possible readers. How many possible interactions is that? So uh, he says, in small societies with few pairs of members, the resulting necessary transfer can engage directly between pairs of individuals. Right? And you can see that technology enables uh, this in a new way, you know, with Craigslist, uh, with eBay. These are our pairwise exchanges. But they are, in fact, mediated by a new uh, kind of publisher of this content. So the mathematics that makes pairwise conflict re uh, uh, resolution difficult in large societies makes pairwise economic transfers also inefficient. He says large societies can function economically only if they have a redistributive economy in addition to a reciprocal economy. So there's this fundamental mathematical driver that's going to say whether they look like publishers of today or whether they look like something radically different, there's going to be a role in the ecosystem for various kinds of people who aggregate, right? who aggregate eyeballs, who aggregate readers for authors, who aggregate authors for readers, who aggregate uh, uh, you know, products for distribution. Uh, the pattern repeats again and again. So we better get good at it. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to get more visibility and sales for authors than they can get on their own. You know, so this is really uh, means that one of your core competencies has got to be to get good at digital distribution. 
So, you know, there's been a lot of angst, I think, recently uh, because of what appears to be the collapsing of the digital distribution channel. You know, so Stephen Covey makes an exclusive deal with Amazon. Oh, my gosh, the retailer is becoming the publisher. And, yes, that's potentially a legitimate threat, and it's a real threat if you believe some of the, the pundits out there who say, oh, the ebook wars are over. This is before the iPad came out, and then they decided, oh, no, no, actually, Apple was now the winner. Uh, it doesn't usually work out that way. There's not a single winner. Uh, uh, and, you know, here's our data from O'Reilly. You know, uh, the uh, leading standalone ebook reader is that little orange slice. The blue is all the rest. Because there are a lot of ebook channels already out there, and we're selling through all of them. Now, not all of them matter, but some of them matter a lot. Some of them are those we built ourselves, some of them are uh, new channels that are emerging. There's a concept I want to share with you that's gotten very popular in uh, startup circles, software startup circles, and it's the, it's the concept of minimum viable product. This guy named Eric Reese has a wonderful blog called Lessons Learned. And he talks about the, the job of a startup is to learn as quickly as possible what the market really wants. Because it's really easy to go down the garden path and develop something really big and complex and then find that nobody wants it. And this is particularly true with emerging technology. You know, when, when you publish a book, you're not solving for a whole lot of different equations at once. You're not trying to solve the format that people will adopt, the channels they'll use to acquire it, uh, you know, the, the type of content. All you have to do is say, okay, we're trying to tell a story that people will like, for example, if you're, if you're selling novels. Right? You're solving only one problem because it was a defined industry. But the industry is now in an undefined phase again. And we need to learn quickly. So this idea that's central to uh, this lean startup methodology is, is this uh, concept of minimum viable product. And that is, the minimum viable product is that version of a new product which allows a team to collect the maximum amount of information about customers with the least effort. It's very contrary to this idea that you've got to build this absolutely killer whiz-bang product. You know, it's actually the product that teaches you the most in an emerging market that is important. And there's this really interesting post from our very own Andrew Savikas that, that really drove this home. And, and it, it, it tells uh, uh, something important about what we need to learn. Uh, when the uh, Android phones came out and started to be popular and there was a new ebook reader uh, for Android, Andrew didn't know whether it was going to be successful or not. But he had built the capabilities at O'Reilly for us to find out really quickly. And so in his TOC blog post, what he wrote, I really like that, he said, uh, with the nearly uh, um, 200 Microsoft Press eBooks now available through O'Reilly.com, we've begun adding the Android.apk application file to our eBook bundle. We don't know yet if enough people are interested to bother installing the application, uh, but we thought it's worth trying. Right? And guess what? For long, we found that we were selling a lot. That's actually our Android sales relative to iPhone. Right? So it's not quite a quarter the size of, of the, uh, the iPhone market, but still significant. And we were able to discover that really quickly because we had built the capability to go into the market quickly, test it, learn, figure out what works. Similarly, we're able to figure out you know, uh, are we better off selling through uh, a store like the Stanza store or with a standalone app? Uh, are we better off selling PDFs or EPUB? Are we better off pricing at this level or that? All of this is product and market discovery, right? So a big part of what you have to build for yourself or acquire is the capability to create the product quickly in new formats, right? And then sell it into emerging channels. You know, because we have a digital distribution tool chain, we were able to, to actually say, OK, new format, great. Flick a switch. A couple of days later, hundreds of e-books, test the market, find out what we want to do. OK, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about marketing, because this is obviously a huge part of what publishers bring to the table relative to the immense creativity that can be brought to the table by authors and uh, small developers. Um, 
The, the latest buzz, of course, is social media marketing. And I, I agree very much that this is a, is a hot new area, and I'm going to spend a little time on it. But uh, when we look at it, let's remember this power law. Uh, and here am I, you know, I'm through the, the lucky accident of being on the Twitter suggested user list, I'm fairly high up that curve. But what do I do with that power? You know, I tend to basically point to things that other people have done. I see myself as a switchboard. And if you look at my, this is a, a tag cloud uh, from some while back, or a word cloud, rather, of, of my tweets. And one of the, the biggest thing you see there is RT, retweeting, right? Because what I'm doing is I'm pointing to things that other people have done. I'm effectively a publisher. I am saying, hey, this is good over here. This is good over here, right? And I love this slide. Uh, this was a guy who I, I retweeted and he, he called it the Tim O'Reilly bump, as he, you can see his, his number of friend feed followers just shot up when I pointed to him and said, wow, Venture Hacks is a great read, right? And this is really the most important thing to get about social media marketing. Who you, you gain and bestow status through those you associate with. So who you're paying attention to, who you're passing on the word about is critical. And so, you know, as a publisher, a key function of your brand is, is, is the bestowal of status. You're bestowing status on your authors. And so it's really important not to think about social media marketing as something you do just to promote your product. In fact, I think because of this economics of many to many, the mathematics of many to many, what I find myself trying to do is, is not to promote even products so much as to promote people. Because I'm trying to build the following of my authors more than I'm trying to build, uh, say, the sales of my product. See if that makes sense, because I can't push enough product through my Twitter feed to get the attention that it needs. But every time I can get you know, another few hundred followers to one of my authors, they're able to do their own social media marketing. Right? But it's also that if you only pay attention to your own news, you're not as valuable to your community. Because social media marketing is really about finding and building a community of people who care about the things you care about. And if you are simply broadcasting, you don't learn from your readers and you don't bind them to them, bind them to you by amplifying their voice. Right? So when you look at some of the things we're doing at O'Reilly in social media, we are trying to build the, the, the status of our authors. So we have an author por portal. And one of the things that's really interesting when you look at some of the, the features of our site, you know, we, we do conferences, and that's one of the ways that we give status to our authors. But it's really amazing when you look at the listing of O'Reilly events, uh, of uh, author events, we're showing where our authors are appearing, whether it's an O'Reilly event or somewhere else, right? And in fact, uh, on any given listing, you'll find that the O'Reilly events are maybe 10, 15% of the, of, the, of the presence, because we really care about building our, our authors. That's our job, right? And so, you know, I just have a snapshot of the top of the list, but there's mention of this conference, but everything else are, we're boosting people at other people's events. And this is a lot about um, the secret of social media. Brian Halligan, who's the author of one of the social media books, uh, describes, uh, he said, would you rather be uh, I forget the city he picked, some little podunk town or New York City. New York City is a hub. You know, uh, there's all kinds of, of traffic in and out. And you want the site that you build to be a hub of traffic, uh, not uh, an endpoint. So great story for me of authors is a guy who wrote a book for us on web performance tuning. And he got his job as uh, chief performance architect at Google as a result of his book. I go, that's super valuable. Uh, for him, and it's super valuable for us that we were able, through our, you know, our status building function, to get him that job, even though it didn't get us a penny of additional revenue. So you got to think that way when you think social media marketing, uh, because social media is a great way to get through that haystack. But you know, coming back to this problem of haystacks, again, it's a mathematical problem. There's a lot of data out there. And one of the things that we learned in the Google era, which, by the way, and don't just because social media is the, is the hot new thing, don't forget that search engine optimization has led to huge companies 
Uh, people who understood this have made a lot of money. Publishers are still extremely weak in this area. Uh, you know, getting found in, in uh, search results is still absolutely critical. But the lesson I want to take uh, from the SEO era is that there's a new breed of social media analytics tools that are coming on. The same way that people over the last decade learned to, to understand Google, people are now starting to understand Twitter, Facebook, and other social media and measure it so that you know what happens. So analytics are the heart of social media marketing. So there's point tools like Bitly. When I do a, um, a, a, a tweet, I use a short link which has a unique code, and I actually can see, I just did this this morning, and it tells me here are all the tweets, you, you know, the retweets you got, and the, actually the clicks that I got through uh, on that link. There's also tools like uh, HubSpot. HubSpot, actually one of many, uh, this is really a social media marketing toolkit. Uh, Brian Halligan, the guy I mentioned, the author of that social media marketing book uh, called the Inbound Marketing Book, uh, built this tool um, uh, you know, as uh, um, a, a way for companies to monitor and measure and respond to social media traffic. I want to talk a little bit about another tool, which is Twitter-specific, because uh, we've actually done some interesting work with, with these guys, our, our research group. Uh, this works in, uh, People Browser is a, is a Twitter client, but they also have a lot of, of data, and they've, they've built some analytics functions. And one of the things they've done that's really kind of interesting is, is to develop kind of a social media uh, cycle. That is, you start with search an analysis, you find who are the people who care about the things you care about. Because one of the secret uh, uh, wonderful things in social media is you have sentiment attached to people. And you can start to find who are the people who care about something. And then what you can do is you can follow them. right? Again, so it's reciprocal. You don't, you don't just broadcast to them, you follow them. Some number of them follow you back. And, and then you can start a conversation with them, right? And then you monitor that conversation. And so uh, what, what People Browser has done is to build a set of tools for m monitoring and managing that cycle. So we just recently did uh, some work analyzing uh, sentiment with People Browser, uh, analyzing sentiment on uh, Super Bowl ads. And we were able to see uh, what people thought of them. The, the, the companies that are engaged with People Browser, uh, there's a lot of, of Hollywood studios, and they're basically trying to figure out who really cares about our product, and why do they care, and how do we engage with them? And they can start to find who are the people who are most active, the big mouths, so to speak, who are going to talk about us, and, and then they can start to have that conversation. But when you have that conversation, uh, you know, in, in social media. So remember, this is going to start happening in ebooks as well. That was one of the points I tried to make in the conversation with Ray Kurzweil last night. An ebook knows it's being read. And that's a really interesting thing about it. And I think there's going to be some really interesting social tools growing up in the ebook eco e e ecosystem, and we're going to need to watch for that. So pay attention there. You know, analytics are going to help you find what products are working, what channels are working, what prices are working. Pricing, by the way, really important area. You know, there's a lot of debate about should they be low, should they be high. This is something we can discover. You know, we should be doing a lot of pricing experiments. One of the reasons I'm a fan of the agency pricing model is that it allows lots of publishers to do experiments instead of only one retailer. Right? Uh, and I think that, that uh, we need more experiments. But we also need to know who's spreading the word about, uh, about our products and what readers think. And I think the tools for monitoring this are going to be there. But I want to go back to a story before bed. Uh, how many of you saw this in the Ignite presentation the other day? The reason I bring uh, this back around is because it's a product. It's actually, you know, if you're thinking about it, a story before bed is really a retailer. It's a specialty retailer. Uh, but it's a specialty retailer that has figured out something really unique about social media. The social media is literally part of the product. You, know, you basically you know, buy this product to share with someone else. And that's a really, really powerful insight. And it's kind of an interesting uh, you know, comparison with what Ray showed us last night. You know, here's a book uh, that's read by a professional author uh, or by you know, this high-tech wizardry, text-to-speech. And here, you know, here's a book that's read by grandpa. I mean, 
which of these is the winner? You know, I think Red by Grandpa is going to be the winner. And I think, so again, there's a lot to think about in, in how that social intelligence is actually going to start to feed into the development of, of the product itself. And this may be a, a step in that direction. But I want to leave you with just the idea that uh, is so central to me in my own thinking about social media. Remember that it's not about trying to sell something. It's about trying to add value. You know, it's not about broadcasting information about you, your product, or your story. It's really about how you add value to a community that cares about the things that you care about and that you're part of. So if you want to have a social media impact, don't think about what you can get out of it. Think about what you can contribute. And the more value that you create for a community, the more people will talk about you and the more value they will create back for you. This is a secret that's uh, been carried out as long as, uh, as, as there has been social media in areas from open source software through, uh, through Facebook. So that, I just want to leave you with a motto that we try to follow in our work at O'Reilly, and I hope that you will follow it in your own explorations of this wonderful future that we're trying to build together, and that is create more value than you capture. It's not just about what you can get out of it. It's about what you can create for others. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for coming to the conference.